Hello everyone, this is Brian Weigel, and in this lecture we will be discussing the process of transition from hunter foragers to complex societies in Southwest Asia. It is a review of the 2018 edition of the Human Past, World Prehistory and the Development of Human Societies, pages 198 through 229. Southwest Asia is a crossroads between the African continent, Europe, and Asia. It's a large area, but we will primarily be focused on Anatolia, the Levant, so Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Syria, um, Turkey, and then also um, Iraq and Mesopotamia, the Fertile Crescent, which is an arc that stretches above the, or just to the north and east and west of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers that constitute Mesopotamia. It's a varied habitat and there's quite a bit of climatic and um, topographic diversity in this region, um, rich in wild animals, sheep and goats in particular, also wild varieties of pigs and cattle. Uh, it's the plant life that really does form the story here with wild varieties of wheat and barley, uh, also rye. There are plenty of legumes, lentils, peas, beans, um, other types of wild foods in this region. And we will note that um, during the Epipaleolithic period or that time after the last glacial maximum and towards the end of the Upper Paleolithic uh, and that period immediately following, um, the Paleolithic period, this region was especially productive and there was more moisture in the environment, um, slightly more rainfall than we see in the area today. Today, we obviously think of this as uh, quite harsh, hot desert environment, very dry. Uh, but 20 to 12,000 years ago, uh, there was slightly more moisture and it was a very rich and productive environment that allowed uh, hunt complex hunter-gatherers to begin to expand their food economy into what we would call a broad spectrum economy, where they make use of all of these different edible plants and animals in their environments to such an extent that they can begin to uh, be less mobile, to have to move around in that food quest less than they had before when they were focused primarily just on migrating large game. So here we have the Middle East and that fertile crescent, which really kind of begins in the Nile Delta region and goes through Jordan and Syria and southern southeastern Turkey down into Mesopotamia uh, towards the Persian Gulf. Uh, the Zagros Mountains on the eastern edge of this uh, were uh, the foothills in particular had grasslands and goats and sheep, uh, where the wild varieties of these um, early domesticates uh, flourished in their wild natural habitat. Uh, here we see uh, differences and some key sites we'll be talking about, in particular Abu Huraira and the um, transition from forest and fairly dense woodland um, to uh, vast stretches of steppe dominated by um, kinopods and tussock grasses, uh, transitioning over time to areas uh, that are dominated by trees, mostly thin scatters of trees and some um, isolated pockets. So the forest is kind of thinned out um, as time goes on, but those grasslands, um, especially where wheat and rye are growing in the wild are really in particular shown in uh, maps B and D, uh, these rich zones during this period. And those are the resources where uh, these Natufian hunters, foragers began to make use of uh, grasses and seeds as part of their broad spectrum um, diet. So this fertile crescent environmental setting sort of changes through time. Uh, 13,000 BC, we're looking at map A here. Uh, by 11,000 BC, map B 
And so you see the forest change up through 7500 BC. And this led the archaeologist Robert Braidwood to explore his uh, hilly flanks hypothesis for the rise of these complex civilizations that occurred after the Epipaleolithic period. So Braden Wood put together one of the first multidisciplinary field approaches with experts from a range of disciplines to go out into these Zagros Mountains and into the Levant and look for those um, ev archaeological evidence of the first interaction between humans and these wild species of cereal grains in particular. If we take a broad Southwest Asia timeline, the Upper Paleolithic ends uh, at about the, the uh, just prior to the height of the last glacial maximum for Europe, 22,000 to 20,000 BC. The Epipaleolithic climatic amelioration begins after 20,000 BC and goes through the end of the late glacial period um, at 12,000 BC. The aceramic Neolithic period or that Neolithic New Stone Age period, uh, but before they're using ceramics in this region, is an important marker archaeologically. It's absent of ceramic pottery from 12,000 to 6,900 BC. And then that critical point at 6,900 BC onward when ceramics are then put into use um, for cooking vessels and storage and um, as the form of pottery. Uh, and these are, this map shows some key sites we'll be discussing in this lecture, in particular, the site of Ainin um, and Abu Huraira, um, Gobekli Tempe, which we discussed the previous lecture, and uh, most of all, perhaps Chateau Hoyuk and the ancient site of Jericho, um, among these others. Ohalo II, of course, and Ain Ghazal, also really important as these sites really fill in this whole period between 12,000 BC and through the ceramic Neolithic period. It is really a story about grasses um, or posea grains. Uh, here is a map showing the change in the percentage of different types of grasses in the form of these colored bar charts uh, in um, the recent article uh, by Weed, no, no other than the author's name is Weed. Um, and he published a systematic review of wild grass exploitation in relation to the emergence of cereal cultivation throughout the Epipaleolithic and the aceramic Neolithic of the Fertile Crescent, published in PLUS One in 2018. And really, uh, this is what we're talking about wild stands of these native grasses that uh, began this symbiotic relationship with the Natufians, hunter gatherers who were picking these wild seeds and bringing them back into their encampments as one aspect of a food source that they could actually store communally and uh, use at a later date. The one thing about cereal grains are you dry them out they can store for quite some time uh, readily uh, in a stable sort of way, um, particularly if they are contained properly. So this Fertile Crescent region during the Epipaleolithic, we see uh, increasing numbers of hunter-gatherers clustered in Braden Woods hilly flanks, that is the foothills, and that's where you see this crest of sites going around and outlining the Fertile Crescent, going up the Levant into Jordan, Syria, Turkey, and down then to the Zagros Mountains, just east of the Tigris River and the border of Iraq and Iran. So we want to talk about several of these sites. And one reason why we call this the Neolithic, the New Stone Age, is because of the introduction of these miniature blades, um, bladelets, or microliths, um, various types of stone slivers or sharp stone slivers um, that we begin to see the mobile hunter-gatherers 
um, who are increasingly focusing attention on the wild gazelle populations of these hilly planks. And we call their the changes through their stone industries, uh, Kabaran first, which is found at that important site of Ohalo II from 20,000 to 15,000 BC. You can see these little bladelets, which are meant to be hafted into a handle of some sort. In some cases, those tools may have been sickles to cut the stems of the wild grasses that they're consuming. And then the next phase, uh, which is found at many sites, but uh, the periods uh, which are documented in the site, Neve David, uh, from 15,000 to 12,500 BC, the style changes just slightly to what's called the geometric Kabaran phase. And that's followed by the Natufians, which is shown at sites like Ainan and Jericho um, during the early part of the A-ceramic period for 12,000 to 9,600 BC. This Epipaleolithic would have been a fascinating time to live. It was a time of plenty and relative peacefulness among hunter-gatherer groups that are beginning to increase in numbers and increase because of that. It's harder for them to move around between different rich areas with resources. So we begin to see increasing sedentism or longer term occupations of sites and slightly more elaborate housing structures still in the form of huts, larger communities form and food storage begins of some of those stable um, resources that Natufians are able to get from their local environments. So this increased sedentism is made possible uh, by uh, their very broad spectrum economy. And this critical site at Ohalo II uh, dates back as early as 20,000 BC in northern Israel along the Sea of Galilee. And it is sedentary. These people lived here probably year round in tight clusters of oval huts. You can see the outline of one of these Ohalo II huts here, and they stored wild plants on a pretty small scale, but they did have communal storage and they're consuming wild animals, particularly focusing on gazelle in many cases. And there's lots and lots of seeds, fruit seeds and other types of seeds. They're taking many different things from their environment. And, and as a result of their broader diet, they don't have to go as far away from camp or move their camp as often um, as they used to. Also at Ohalo II, as I've mentioned, they had a diverse diet, um, lots of seeds and fruits, acorns, zimmer wheats, legumes, gazelle, deer, fish, and birds, part of the diet that they're consuming. It's preserved fairly well because it's on the beach of the sea here. And as the water came up, you get that lacustrian uh, sediment uh, and site formation where the water log actually helps preserve organic materials. And so you have excellent preservation here. And as the, sea the, the uh, water level of the Sea of Galilee has gone down, it exposed these, uh, the settlement on the ancient beach shores. Very well preserved. There is a single burial at Ohalo too. There may be more by now. It's a male, 35 to 40 years. He has his head resting on these three stones um, at the site. It's not really typical. It's kind of a unique human experience at Ohalo II at 20,000 years ago. Most of these Kabaran using proto Natuvians were mobile hunter gatherers still and weren't doing the economy that we see at Ohalo II. But what's important is Ohalo II represents the things that are to come for human societies in this region. This broad spectrum revolution that at least begins with a period of transhumans where people are migrating up and down the mountain slopes from the lowland to the highland in search of seasonal migrating animals and seasonal resources. New hunting strategies emerge. We, they're focused on these medium to small game animals, birds and fish, seeds and fruit, gazelle, like you see pictured here. 
other early Upper Paleolithic sites at about 12,000 BC, so much later than Ohalo II, uh, we begin to see increased occupations, more common um, Ohalo II style sites, uh, more permanent structures, this broad spectrum revolution, and they continue to focus on gazelle. Important sites include Neve David, where larger aggregations are documented. People are staying at their base camps much longer. They don't have to move their camps um, to find new resources. Uh, and uh, at, at Uan El Ham, Hamam, uh, we see seven burials in a cemetery and microliths, and um, other sites occupied for thousands of years with stone house structures at Kara Ne site. Neve David is large and extensive. You can see where it falls on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea in this map. It's very deeply buried, um, as, you know, with respect to other sites in the area. There is ground stone technology, which is an indication that they're processing these cereal grains by grinding them into flour that can be cooked into griddle cakes, pancake-like foods. There are two burials at the site, which involve stone slab, bur slab lined burial pits. And there is a stone mortar placed near the head of the individual, an indication of how important grinding of wild seeds has become uh, by 12,000 BC. After 12,000 BC, there's a rich period of villages developing in the Fertile Crescent at sites like Ain Mahala at 12,000 to 9,600 BC. Those layers are preserved at that site. And Jericho, beginning as early as 12,000 BC to present, uh, Jericho is a key site. It's been occupied for over 12,000 years, 14,000 years by people, and it begins as a village at 12,000 BC. Other important sites, Abu Huraira, Jurf al Hamar, Ain Ghazal, Chateau Hoyuk, uh, fill out this early sequence of the um, aceramic to the ceramic period transition, so we can see where ceramics appear in the archaeological record and the social changes that brings about following that key date of 6900 BC. The late Epipaleolithic period in this Levant region is very well represented by Ain Mahala, which is referred to in the biblical Old Testament as Ainan, uh, located in northeastern Israel. It dates to 12,000 to 9,600 BC, representing fairly well what the macro band societies or larger hunter gatherer bands uh, that we refer to as the Natufians. They built these D shaped huts, fairly substantial structures, as you can see, in complementary ecological zones where they selected their village location strategically to be between the hills and the lake margins where they could access a very wide variety of food sources. So here's a structure at Ain Mahala uh, where you can see circular house structures, burial pits just outside the door of their houses, storage bins, central hearths, and quite a few pestles and mortars that indicate that they are grinding grass seeds. Ain Mahala also has some early evidence of ancestor worship, these human skulls that are exhumed from their burials and plastered over with cowrie shells inset in the eye sockets and other sort of pre-ceramic type plaster statues, which also have these cowrie shells staring back at us and signify perhaps some form of worship of their deceased ancestors. Another key site documenting the early period, which is critical for that 
really long stretch of millennium in the aceramic leading up to and after the ceramic period. So transition from hunter foragers on the landscape to farming represented at Abu Huraira, a very important sequence of cultural chronology shown in the archaeological deposits going back in time at the site. And it demonstrates that lengthy millennial long process of domestication of cereal plants and wild animals from this area. It also documents early structures in the circular huts in the early period. And then later that shift architectural style shift to the rectangular houses um, of the Neolithic villages. What was life like for the Natufians from 12,000 to 9,600 BC? Those microliths are inserted into a tool we might call the sickle, a replica is shown here. And we can tell that they were using the stones inset into these wooden or bone handles to cut grasses because the silica from these grasses, from their phytolithic structures, remain preserved fairly well on the stone microliths that were used to consistently harvest these. There's also those mortars and grinding slabs for processing. In the early aceramic period, we see communal grain storage, the beginning of cemeteries, which is really socially important because when you start to see a group who lives in an area most of the year and they have a dedicated, often sacred ground or space where they bury their dead communally, nothing says this land or area belongs to us, like putting generations after generations of ancestors in a public space near your village by burying their dead ceremoniously and communally in this plot, they're stating that this is really their territory at a time before land ownership really is um, a thing. So we also see the emergence of the public spaces and also private habitats. So the concept of a central court courtyard or a park, which is publicly owned and used space, is different in the mindset than that closed door habitat or structure, the early hut, where people can now um, have material possessions that they don't have to carry with them everywhere. And really, for the first time in human societies, you can hide some of your personal material behind your closed door of a private space. And that starts to change the nature of social organization following the Natufians. Also in Natufian, we see increased trade and economic networks where marine shells used to uh, make jewelry like this Natufian necklace, very beautiful necklace made out of shells. Uh, obviously from the coastal regions and the obsidian, which are up in the Anatolia area, like sites of Chateau Hoyuk and others that have a obsidian source nearby. Obsidian volcanic glass, very useful in stone tool technology and for making those microlithic tools. So uh, the trade between items of personal endowment and also this continued intensification of their previous diets. So some of those resources within their broad spectrum economy are now getting increased focus and attention, a process we would call intensification, particularly of those wild grass cereal seeds and the wild gazelle in the region. What was it life, what was life like in death for the Natufians? We mentioned this concept of cemeteries emerging. Um, we also see increased burial items or possessions with people, animal teeth, stone beads, marine shells, bracelets, pendants, burial goods being put in with the deceased. Um, and you can interpret what that may mean to the Natufians. 
So following the Natufian period, people begin to organize themselves a little differently. And we begin to see larger settlements, especially at sites like Jericho, and in particular, Chateau Hoyuk in Anatolia, which are unusual for the period of 9600 BC. Most people are still moving about a bit and living a transhuman way of life, similar to the earlier Natufians. Uh, it, but now they're coming together in these clustered villages or larger sediments with higher populations. Jericho, as I mentioned, uh, is the longest continuously inhabited village on earth, as far as we can tell, with people living there communally um, year-round for the last 14,000 years. There's other very ancient sites in the area that are still cities that are still being occupied after many, many millennia, Damascus, um, Aleppo, uh, other sites that are very cities that are today, uh, well, obviously struggling through civil war, but have a very long history of human habitation. Some of the oldest continuously inhabited places on the planet. Um, Multiple walls were found at Jericho during the aceramic period. Early, um, there was a ditch and a stone wall. Uh, it may, I mean, the, the walls uh, have crumbled in the past. There's evidence it is an earthquake area, uh, but multiple crumbling events of the walls at Jericho have been documented archaeologically. Not clear if the walls were defensive from humans or defensive from floodwaters, but either way, they were a defensive feature that enclosed the settlement. Kathleen Kenyon excavated the site of Jericho and really defined the aceramic period in that transition from um, two distinctive sections of the aceramic, the pre-pottery Neolithic A and the pre-pottery Neolithic B sequences of cultural um, zones. At Jericho, we see this phenomenon of removing the skulls from the dead, a continuation of Natufian-type practices, where the face is reconstructed with plaster, uh, and cowrie shells are inset into the eye sockets. This becomes quite a common theme in the early Neolithic period. Chateau Hoyuk is an interesting site. It's different than the other sites of this period from 7,300 to 6,000 BC. It's a larger scale village. They're using clustered rectangular houses that are, there's no real alleys between them. You access these from the roof so you can walk around on people's roofs and drop in literally from the ceiling. Burials occur under the sleeping platforms. Here you can see one example of a sleeping platform, their bed in the, in the hut, and beneath it is buried the ancestors. So ancestor worship is clearly part of the social fabric of sites like Chateau Hoyuk. Interestingly, um, you know, the site looked like this. Here's an artist's impression of Chateau Hoyuk. Uh, people hanging out on the roofs. You can see the ladders. Uh, looks like apartment complexes. There are a couple of common areas, particularly in the center of the cluster and other places around uh, to graze some early domesticate, um, early stages of domestication of those wild gazelle um, starting to take place. The reason Chateau Hoyuk became, let's say, larger, maybe even slightly wealthier than other uh, societies is because they're located near a uh, rich source of volcanic glass in the Anatolia Mountains, um, uh, the obsidian mine. So the people of Chateau Hoyuk begin to really kind of specialize in part of the region's economy as um, by controlling the means of obsidian mining production into blanks that could be easily traded up and down the Fertile Crescent. 
So it's different than these other villages, and it controlled the regional obsidian trade. We start to see some household differences where around 20% of the structures are what might be considered shrine-like, or they are modified in a particular way that's different than the majority of habitat structures. Are these shrines? Do they belong to a wealthier elite class of people at Chateau Hoyuk that could afford to do some interior decorating? And another important imagery that we begin to see very early here at Chateau Hoyuk is this human or person. Sometimes it's a man, sometimes it's a woman. In this case, it's a woman between two beasts or maybe they're lions um, here, but she is sitting really on a throne. And I will note the um, rather plump or slightly obese nature of this, which in one case resembles those Venus figurines from way back in the Gravidian period of the upper Paleolithic. So it may represent fertility or plenty uh, if and there's no fast food there at that time, but if somebody is able to eat enough calories that they can become this large um, on diet, that signifies a level of availability and wealth to food resources. Now, the between two beasts becomes an important motif later, and it's representing things, at least how we can interpret them, the beasts represent nature or the wild or the wilderness. And the human here in this case is literally between the beasts, but instead of being devoured and killed, the human is the master here. So we can interpret this as humans conquering nature. The actual artistic representation of that process of domestication that is occurring here. We have an example of what the inside of one of these huts sort of looks like with their storage bins that they have and their sleeping platform. Not a lot of space here, but there's storage is clearly part of the routine. And on the left in the photo, you see the excavation of what is sort of a larger shrine-like room. You see the auric horns here uh, and uh, just more space and uh, what appears to be paint and red ochre, uh, maybe from the walls, but on the floor. Um, so are these shrines, are they upper class? There's just, um, like I said, about 20% or so of the structures are this way. So it is interesting phenomenon, as is that um, ritual of skull caching and you can see here the human that is missing the skull that was taken. And then on the right, the plastered skulls that are found at sites as early as Chateau Hoyuk. What is this process of domestication of plants? Uh, it, we know, changes the plant species genetically to the point where it is after domestication process is complete, it has more attributes that people want, like larger, more seeds that don't shatter as easy um, as their wild counterparts, uh, and just more um, return on their investment, making it easier to bring these seeds back to camp and process them without losing them on the way. So we start to see over time um, in the Early and late periods, the percentage of wild and cultivated barley, this trend towards the cultivation of wild barley in the Fertile Crescent. Animal domestication also is going on between the early and late aceramic transition. Intense focus on goat, sheep, and then cattle and pig. Uh, you see the wild range of sheep here in the area of which where they are first domesticated, encompassing this area of Chateau Hoyuk. Ceramics, interestingly, begin to be used in some of the earliest evidence of ceramic use 
occurs between 7th and 6,000 BC at Shahar Hogalan site, where we begin to see some of the earliest evidence for clay firing. And it's not necessarily ceramic vessels yet as artistic forms there. We see the lizard head figurines that are being produced as interesting motif, also of rather voluptuous um, individuals uh, that are slightly obese, at least in this representation, but what to make of this alien looking face, not arguing for extraterrestrial life at this point. But I will say, you know, what does the lizard man from these early figures represent? It's a question we would like to answer. Another thing we begin to see, especially after the rise of ceramics during the ceramic Neolithic after 6900 BC, we begin to see the introduction of ceramic vessels. This starts to vary regionally, and that coincides with changes in settlement patterns that occurred in this transition. And it's no coincidence that dental caries or cavities in your teeth appear really for the first time. Um, with the advent of storage vessels. So these complex carbohydrates that we're getting from the cereal grains um, are not particularly good for our tooth health. Images of humans conquering nature motifs here, uh, carrying the wild gazelle and carrying a basket of the grasses uh, we have Gilgamesh conquering a lion in this wrestling pose, rather erotic um, imagery here of humans literally conquering and dominating wild beasts uh, on the right. The man between two beasts motif at the top of this iconography, and you see the beasts serving humans with various products that are being made as uh, in the lower motifs here, gazelle is bringing wine to the human and the lion is bringing goods and olive oil and, and these types of imagery that really does represent the confidence of humans now in being masters and control of their local environments. So the process is, while un maybe unintentional, not lost on the fact of people uh, who lived at that time. So in conclusion, this is a long transition that begins 20, 22,000 years ago at Ohalo 2, where hunter-gatherers begin collecting lots and lots of seeds, and they start storing those um, seeds for future use. And so we start to see the increased sedentism of hunter, harvester, foragers, larger macro band societies with very broad spectrum economies and more substantial living structures, some communal storage events, all during the earliest aceramic period. Uh, and as time goes on, particularly this 9600 BC to 6900 aceramic period where wild plants are now being in the, domesticated in that process, and this accommodates for larger, larger human populations to begin. So just to quickly thank our references, the textbook we've been reviewing in this series of lectures provides many of the images and much of the information um, edited by Chris Scare, and lots of supplemental images um, are um, obtained through Google image search and Bing image search for images that are um, licensed through the Creative Commons um, copyright arrangement. Thank you for your time and attention.